Morning. Morning, sir. All right. Sorry. It's cold. It's, yeah, but I'm stood here with a semi on, so I'm warm. <laughs> Ew. It's not often I get cars in where I'm like, oh, I want this, but I want this. Yeah, it's not often. RHGT, bro. Yes. So, get through the intro. I'll go and take a cold shower somewhere and I'll catch you in a minute. Let's do it. Oi, oi. Morning. We always get asked what this is. So this is a series one free door uh, and it's going to Australia. So my friend out there bought it and it's worthless over here, but it's worth money out there. So we're just waiting for a basically for him to transport it over. But ah. not my bag, but it's a series one with a roof scoop. Oh, I don't know, mate, JDM <laughs> stuff, who knows? So yeah, it's all good. But... What is happening? Uh, Mark's is all done, ready to go. Next, we're waiting on the roof motor still. Uh, so Mark's we've done drive shaft, wheel bearing, gear linkage and a few other bits and pieces. That's ready to go. Uh, what is this one? Uh, I think the client has literally just walked down the driveway to pick this one up. Cool. So this is going, that's had suspension, service, and oil pipes. Uh, the RS6, we've put um, oil control valves in it and we started it the other day and it hasn't smoked. So we've run it up and we've left it and we see if it smokes again. So we can get that back to George. So hopefully it's sorted, but that one's beat me up. Um, Affles is in for a service and he thinks his damper's gone. So we'll get that on a ramp later and have a look. Um, Another RX6. But we've looked after that one for since I opened. So we look after it every year for him. So that's easy peasy. Um, uh, Hurricane's ready to go. Before we got interrupted. Uh, so the red Hurricane's done, ready to go. Um, Finally. We're just, well, it's been done for ages. Ah, I'm just okay. a free storage unit, aren't I? So don't pay your bill and get free storage. <laughs> Win! Win. Uh, Simons is no longer Simons. That is now belongs to a new owner uh, and it's leaving the country. So rather than him building a new one, which he asked us to do, it just so happened at the same time Simon wanted to sell his. So uh, we've got a few little bits and pieces of dirt that um, the new owner wants to do before it goes. And then it will get exported. That's the best. That's the best spec twin turbo R8 in in the country. Yeah, yeah, in the country. Easy peasy. That's amazing. That car. Um, uh, uh, waiting on parts for V3. Okay. Um, Another twin turbo. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Golf. We're waiting on a VVT variator and. Pete's. So last week we had Dave Cresswell's blue R8 in the middle. Do you remember it? Yep. Um, that's his son's. So that's Pete's. Nice. The best R8 ever made. Can we say that again? Best R8 ever made. R8 GT. Fair play. It's got LMX wheels on it, which isn't my bag, but Pete's like, Pete likes them. I'd have proper GT wheels on it. But, and it's got GT buckets, the proper buckets. I don't know whether you can see them or whether we would have to get. Should we have to, should we go get some keys in a minute and have yeah, a wander around? Okay. That might be quite cool actually. Talk you through the differences to um, uh, a normal R8 to a GT. Yeah, yeah, but definitely. The problem is if I ever buy a GT, I'd never be able to sell it. Because if go. I ever got a GT, it would be the what it'd be the one I'd so it'd be Samoa orange a coupe with buckets and that's it then. You can't ever sell it because you're not going to get another one. That's the unicorn right there. Mm. Unicorn. <laughs> um, Matt, we got order parts for Matt's heads. He's got some bent valves. Um, still waiting on the shift, the roof actuator company to come back about the Lambo. Dan's Shiroko R. I, don't, I think we've seen this a couple of times, or I think on the channel we've seen this a couple of times, but this is in for a service. Uh, he's got new wheels on it, uh, but he's got wheel wobbles. So we'll do a service, we'll balance the wheels and we'll do a wheel alignment. 
So that's in this week. Matt's got Gen 2 R8 up on a ramp. So that's in for service and a check over. That's just been bought by a place in London and the guy just wants it checked over because he's already had a couple of problems with it um, from where he bought it from. There we go. They're pretty in yellow. Looks like, a, looks with carbon blaze as well. It looks good. Yeah, it's yeah. like a bumblebee. Yes, indeed. Um, McLaren in, Mitch is doing uh, a few checks just to rule out some issues. A bit tight. A bit tight there, isn't it, sir? Um, we won't pick that up on the mic, so I don't know why I bothered doing that. No, because the mic's here. Yeah. Uh, so just a few little bits and pieces that clients complained about. So we just go at belt and braces, start at the top, work our way through it, and then we can feed back what it needs. But that's a pretty little thing that is. He's done quite a bit to it. Uh, George's engine is back in. Carl's just uh, done a few bits and pieces. Uh, we've like dressed the oil tank. We're waiting on the, the stock intercoolers, had some broken bolts in them. So we're waiting for those to come back after having the bolts extracted and then we can put them on. But other than that, underneath, it's pretty much back together. Stock brakes are all back on it. Like we had to change the brake hoses. Um, so the AP radicals use a different brake fitting than the stock ones. So then when we went to change the flexi lines, the hard lines like snap off. Oh. So we have to change those, but you can only do that when the engine's out. So that's why it was sat out for so long because we were waiting for the brake lines to turn up. Two new hard brake lines in from the ABS to each corner and then new flexi lines, original stock calipers back on, original discs, same front and rear. So that's essentially going back to like a stage two car and then the rest of his stuff is just sat everywhere. So we've got that one to do then he can have that back and he's gonna sell that. That can go. And then we can concentrate on the saloon, but I'm not doing anything on the saloon until I have a gearbox in my hands. Yep. Because he's putting an upright gearbox in it. And I don't know where that is. So that's someone else's problem to deal with. Indeed. Uh, what else? What are you working on, Juden? Our, our resident car. Our resident happy famous, person. Famous resident. A famous resident. Many people work out. Yeah. Guess whose car this is? I don't think that helps. Is other number plate would be better? H. <laughs> yeah. Guess whose car this is? Who do we know likes Hondas? The same person who likes pegging. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing? Is it a ceramic coat? Polishing yeah. ceramic coat. No. It's so. the cash, isn't it? Yeah, I know. Pay him too much, see? Such a generous boss. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on. Are we, I think we've got some more questions. Let's we get hold of Kate. Can see we? if Kate, yeah, Kate will bring them down. Hello. Peggy Sue. <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> down in Juden's Bay. Because it's cold. Can you come down and say hello? I'm going to get down and give you a paper. All right, thanks. Come down and give me something else if you want. <laughs> <laughs> Bend off! <laughs> Did anybody watch the BSB for the last race <coughs> yesterday? So for those who, this is Monday. Yesterday was the last race at Brands Hatch, so BSB. Tommy Bridewell won the race. Fair play, he had all the pressure. But while he was on the grid afterwards celebrating, He'd sort of done an interview and on camera, he goes to his wife, Stacey, next to him. He goes, oh, you better get them red panties on tonight, love, because it's on. And honestly, I was dead. Thanks, babe. And say, you want to say hi? Hi. Bye. That's the director of comments. Do you mind? I know you're trying to work, but this is a film Sorry, studio. Just talking. 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 This, talking. this is a new whip. It is Japanese whip. <laughs> Japanese whip. <laughs> that is called <laughs> Actually, we've had a lot of requests for you doing more videos, so. Yeah, I don't know why. Well, people like you. They want more, mis they more misery in their lives. 
a bit more realism. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's what we need. It's because everybody in the world today is too giddy and too happy, and what they need is a bit of balance in their life. Yeah. A miserable chap. <laughs> what was the last thing you were like ecstatically happy about? <sighs> Not dying last year? Yeah, that was that was a bit. Or this year? Yeah, it's been nearly a year. Huh? Uh, well, this yeah. time last year, I was it's, gradually dying. You were gradually dying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I made it. I think we're all gradually dying. <laughs> <laughs> I was going a little bit faster towards death. Than yeah. I a little yeah. bit faster towards death. My death race sped up. Your throttle pedal was stuck. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when was the last time you were ecstatically happy? I don't think I ever have been. No. I, we need to get Mary Kate in here because I tell you what. I should say when my children were born, shouldn't I? Or wedding. Wedding. Yeah. Yeah, uh, children. Could you imagine her trying to describe trying to describe his <laughs> That is either a complete weird turn <laughs> or Dav's cut it out, but we won't if he's cut it out we'll just move on. So from Astra Nige, I wonder what car he owns. Great channel Ricky, you're one of the few channels I watch religiously. Couldn't agree more with everything you said about tuning and garage trade. A question for you. What's your car history? What was your first car and what are some highlights and lows of the cars you have owned? I know this is hard to answer as a mechanic as so many cars you own which you never drive. Keep up the good work and great content. My very, very first car was a Fiat Uno 35 and the 45 with a fire engine. It was called a fire, fire engine. Fire, it was, yeah. I remember those. And the washer bottle was a bag. Do you wow. remember? Yeah. The door used to fall off if you opened it up. But that was the car me and Kate used to cruise round in. Um, I think the speaker and the head unit was worth more than the car. I think I paid 250 quid for it. It was matte blue, but not the good matte blue. Yeah. Um, that was my first car. Then I had uh, a Mark IV Escort 1.4 CVH that I put twin Webers on. I cut the scuttle out and put the Webers on. So if I parked it downhill in the rain, the carbs would fill with water. <laughs> Um, and I had that slammed on Sierra Cosworth wheels. Yes. Couldn't go over speed bumps. Um, and I, again, I had ridiculous sub and head unit in that. Then I sold that and I had a B... What was it, Carl? EG would have been B16, right? I think it was a BTI, yeah. Yeah. So then I had a B16 Honda Civic, because it was fast and furious, wasn't it? Split Yep, split boot. Oh yeah, the Range Rover was, it was cool. Boot. And I had that race car low on coilovers. That thing was mental. No air filter, because no VTEC yo. Well, I took the air box, literally just used to unclip the air pipe off the air filter. And just let all And let all the everything. <laughs> yeah, it went faster. <laughs> uh, and I wrote that off at Mannington Roundabout. Um, yeah, I hit a lamppost. The, la the number plate's around here somewhere. But okay. that car was, Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was wicked. Then after that, I had a 1.3 Toyota Corolla, and I bought that because I had a tow bar, because I was racing motocross. Uh, racing was a maybe an over-exaggeration, but I used to turn up at two races <laughs> with a motocross bike, <laughs> get my ass kicked. Um, so I used to tow it around everywhere on a trailer, so I had that. Then I sold that, and me and Kate had her dad's, Rover 200 SDI 225,000 miles Please. rubbish rubbish then we sit me and Kit then our first car together we ever bought was a Peugeot 2306 XSS that's some rubbish isn't it? yeah it's got proper <laughs> shit mate and I owned that for about a year and I could not keep the driver's window in the runner that was the worst, I put door seals in it, little plastic clips that hold them in, that was the worst thing ever. And the driver's door, the driver's seat would never sit. But I paid a lot of money for that car. It was, it looked cool, but it was shit. It was absolute dross. Sure, that problem was clear, didn't you? The yeah, window, window never. Window just about that five times. Everything, just <laughs> rubbish. Then after that, I had, then we went for a stage because we bought our house. We had no money and we'd had Callum. So I had a load of like, say I beefers. Old. Well, the old two litre GTI? No, mate. No, no, 1.4s. Ah! Yeah, yeah. So we had like two of those on the bounce. I had my granddad's Astra Diesel, 1.7 Astra Diesel off him. Then what do we have after that? 
Then, when I went to Bonneville and I came home, we took three cars to Bonneville and one of them was a Viper Green Fabia VRS. And when it came back, because they got covered in salt, all the aluminium underneath the car had like, gone rotten. So I bought that off Skoda really cheap. So that was Kate's car for a while. That was amazing, she'd never have sold that. Skoda! Yeah, it was cool. And then, and then... TSI. Two litre, uh, 1.4 twin charge TSI. Yeah, yeah, piston eater. Yeah, used to eat pistons one, but that was cool so okay had that for ages and then i had a lot of company cars from like 2007 onwards i was always in a company car so kate's car normally wasn't anything trick but i had leon cooper's k1s all those k1s were good yeah those. cool yeah. yeah 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 loads of loads of company cars like that s3s then when of course i got the job doing more on r8s we were running ade cars all the time so i was in r8s so I didn't really have a decent car then, until probably my R8. Like Kate had a Leon, we had that, we bought that on finance, and then we changed that for her Ateca, and we had that for a while, and then we got rid of that, and now she's got an A4, which we bought off your mate. Mike. So my car, yeah, my car history is not great. I don't think it's very cool. My bike history is amazing. I've had some proper bikes. Go on then, let's uh, drop a few bikes. Uh, R6, R1, BMW S1000, uh, majority of race bikes, proper, proper trick race bikes. RVF 400. See, I sit here now and I rag on Hondas, and I've had Hondas. Had few, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's still shit. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I had an SV650 that I could wheelie forever. Yeah, that was cool. Yeah, yeah, that was rubbish. I sold my RVF for that, and I should never have done it because the RVF was. I had the original seventeen inch, seventeen or eighteen inch. I can never remember which way around it was, and I had the original wheel on because everyone used to change them. And I've tried to buy it back since to try and find it, but the the DVLA won't let you know who owns them anymore. Yeah. So that was quite cool. And then now I own my van, and a Rusty Noble, <laughs> and an RS4, and a Golf GTI, and a TTRS. <laughs> And hopefully uh, Skyline. And yes. then while well, waiting for this guy with that Pulsar to mess me back, that'd be cool. SR20s. Oh, no, no, oh mate. SR20s would be worth a fortune a week before race wars. It's true. You know what I'm saying? So, car history is, yeah, shit. <laughs> it's never going to be cool unless you can say I've had a 918, an F40, a McLaren yep. F1. Everybody's car history is rubbish. Well, you can say it. It's rubbish. It would just yeah, be a load of bread. The only person I know that had good car history is Rowan Atkinson. <laughs> I think everybody else. Yeah. So I don't know. You let me know. But I've had some absolute dross. But that Fiat Uno, that Fiat Uno, I rolled that in a field, <laughs> put it back on its side, put it back on its wheels, pushed the mirror out, and you'd never have known. It was amazing. <laughs> Honestly, better than the A class that you rolled in. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was not amazing. <laughs> no, no, many people know about that. <laughs> me, and, me, and my, me and my, like, grew up a lad, he's my best friend, he lives in Marseille now. And he had a Peugeot 205, and I had my Uno. They were absolute dross boxes. I used to fill my Fiat Uno with all the recovery fuel. Kate's going, say bye, Kate. Bye, Kate. Bye. Say bye to Kate in the comments. <laughs> with all the recovery fuel. Yeah. So like it was diesel mix because it was a carb as well and I used to I remember driving down commercial road in Swindon and I revved it out and it was a little bit too much diesel in the mix and it <laughs> absolutely filled commercial road with smoke <laughs> exactly like the RS6 yeah. does that was funny but we used to push each other we used to not on the road we were sensible we used to do it on private roads in Mexico but yeah in Mexico <laughs> but me and him used to drive to our mate's house and I used, just used to push him along by the bumper I crashed, I crashed my Toyota Corolla, playing that game I crashed into the back of him. He stuck and I didn't and I bumped the, and we found a crashed one above the side of the road. We were going to a motocross shop in the and I saw a Toyota Corolla on the side of the road with police tape around it. So we went back that night and nicked the bonnet off it. Bright red it was, I never got it painted. So I had a you just uh, that you camera. <laughs> <laughs> Statue of limitations, man. It's like 20 years ago. It's fine. But I Some also... Guy out there with yeah. still got no bonnets. <laughs> the stuff we used to do, mate, was mental. I think we should probably leave it there.
<laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> or the, is there more? Yeah, do you reckon, Carl? It probably well, is. He's it, just said the crime. Who did it? He's where it took place? When it took place? <laughs> <laughs> Twenty years ago. Can't get in trouble for that. <laughs> And the only policeman I know is watching this, and if he's taking me down, I'm taking him with me. Because <laughs> he's a mate. So, Richard Upcraft. Don't touch anything barn findy. It will be rusty, it will depress you, and it won't get done. Focus on broken cool stuff. Rusty will drive you potty. We've already broken that, because nothing can be more rusty than the no war. So, I think that's just it. Yeah. Anything better than the, anything not as rusty as a noble is a positive do the turbo kits use compound charging if not why not cost complexity or no real benefits over configuration right okay this is going to get in deep so a turbo kit isn't compound it's single it's single charge so it's a single stage so the turbo is driven by the exhaust and then the exhaust takes air in through the turbo charger and then throws it into the engine now you can get compound charging which is where you multiply the charging stage so you have two charging stages so they it's not compound charged but like the 1.4 polos and uh say ibifas and the vrs fabias and stuff like that they were twin charged but they weren't compound they would use supercharger low down and turbocharger higher and they would blend between the two on a little bypass valve that's not compound the evo the big evo I did all the electronics for for Don up in Scotland. That is compound. So that takes, I've got to remember right away now, that takes a turbocharger, so a supercharger, and the outlet of the supercharger feeds the turbo. So you're already putting air into the turbo that's, char that's multiplied, and then the supercharger then is a one to two or whatever multipl multiplication over that. So that thing, I've got to remember, that thing would make two and a half bar at 1400 rpm Oof. and then so what we would do there is we would use it right low down so it made loads of torque low down and then as we as the turbo come on and could deal with that could make that boost because the turbo can't make that oh he's gone to the whiteboard george your pens are flat oh george it's no better that's bad. Right, so just work it in RPM and just do manifold pressure, right? So a turbo would say normally do the uh, like work from vacuum and you'd kind of do like that. Yep. Yeah. So let's say let's say that's easy numbers, two point five bar and then I don't know, let's say last one yeah by adding a supercharger what you can do is is you can do that yeah, yeah? so the turbo that's that's what the turbo can do because you can drive you're driving that as hard as you can so that's everything it can give you and you're using cam timing and ignition and everything you can to drive the turbo on as quick as you can to get the turbo on boost so there's nothing you can do about this area. But that's when we were saying, like last week, when we talked about Matt's car, when you put big turbos on Evos, they, they're horrible. Like small engined big turbo cars are horrible because they've got low airflow. So they've got to do high RPM to get the turbo going to make the boost. So you end up with a lot of, a lot of lag. So by going compound, you can fatten up the bottom end. So the supercharger come on, and it would literally do all the work down the bottom end and then we'd bypass over it. So how we used to do it was, we used to go air filter, supercharger, turbo, manifold, right? Like so. There are intercoolers there, so we were running a two-stage IC as well. So we'd IC it there and we'd IC it there, Yeah. right? So when, you, when you're on, the second you start going, it goes through the supercharger, through the turbo, into the manifold. Then when the turbo comes on and it's doing all this, right? The supercharger, you've got pulleyed so that it's making boost as low as it can, but then the supercharger can't handle the RPM brake at the top. So what you do there is you unload the supercharger with a bypass. 
so like a throttle body and you just open that up so supercharger's naturally got a bypass anyway and then i wrote in the motec a firmware to control a 90 mil drive-by-wire bypass so that then as the turbo come on i would blend the bypass out to take the supercharger out of the yeah, equation yeah. but that's what a compound is but yeah. that makes sense the reason we don't use compounding on the v10s is because supercharging is not the most efficient mainly because you can't get the soup the intercooling right it's got a little intercooler underneath the supercharger and it just heat soaks and you can't pull enough temperature out the other side of it is you kind of don't need it when you've got big airflow like you do on a v10s the turbo turbo's doing 2000 horsepower so it's, it is very very complicated it's hard to get right because it's taken us a long time to get that evo right um and there are other ways of making the power so it's it's not commonly seen but it is cool it is cool when it's done um james hi ricky and kate james here from swindon i've got a question for the next video what's pegging <laughs> We'll get Kate to answer that in the comments. Uh, Mike Tog, question. What percentage of time is spent preparing and measuring for an engine build compared to the time actually putting the parts together? And what tolerances are you working to? I tell everybody the same thing. It's roughly a week to strip, a week to measure, and a week to build. But it will take me a half a day to probably measure and prep ring gaps. And it will take me half an hour to push all 10 pistons in if that makes sense yeah then it's things like so if you imagine i would normally build the piston and rod with no rings put the bearings on put that in the bore all 10 clamp everything up make sure my clearances on my rods and everything are right so my bottom end is right i've already done my measurements with my micrometers on my bearings you normally use a little bit of plastic gauge to sort of help visualize and check the math um, of your measurements on your page. So if you think it is a plastic gauge isn't accurate, but at least you can build it all up and then go, oh yeah, okay, I'm about two thousand or whatever. So, uh, but you put an engine together probably three times before you finally build it. If you gave me a factory V10, or if you gave me everything laid out on a bench right now, nine o'clock in the morning, pistons rods and i haven't got a measure thing i can just assemble it every day every day to put it together but it'll take it can take it can take like a easily three four days to set valve valve height on a head if it's a mess so by valve height and your spring pressure height i mean obviously you cut the seats but your every seat might be different and then you've got to change what your spring pressure is to so set your installed height um if you've got to uh, put rods on and your bearings, so like ACLs or king bearings or anything like that, and you've got to start moving around your bearing shells to get the right clearance on each journal, that takes time. Uh, but if it's all measured out and done, then yeah, it's probably a day to put an engine together. So we normally turn around and say, if you drop me an engine off today, a V10, I'd normally probably give you a monthly time to build from the second I start it to the second I build it. But we're probably building for probably start take the next engine we take probably january february um we got some guys who are really switched on with the race engine stuff where they're like right we're going to drop you three engines on this date so they're already booked in but i know what will happen now race season will finish and people will be like yeah i want engines i want them for february so then that's where the challenge starts uh Hi Kate, such a good channel and worthy of far more subscribers. They don't know what they're missing, but hopefully it reflects quality subs rather than quantity subs. One question consideration, Gen 1 Aventadors have a reputation for having gearbox issues. Is this bad reputation justified or is a problem easily rectified by skills technicians such as those at RE Performance? We only ever see problems, so it's always hard for me to say what a trend is. Uh, but at the end of the day, BMW SMG, Audi R-Tronic, F1 gear, Lamborghini E-gear, Aventador, which is an E-gear. They're all the same system, so they're a manual gearbox with a hydraulic control unit on the side, a hydraulic pump, and then control solenoids that actuate the clutch, actuate the forward and backwards movement or across the gate movement. So if you get solenoid go down, your gearbox 
fails or it stops working. You get a pressure sensor go down, you get a problem. You get a hydraulic pump issue, you've got a problem. We've got a, a V10 out the back at the minute now where I think the hydraulic pump, the electric motor is lazy on a pump. And then the control unit knows it's drawing too much amperage and then it goes into shutdown. So they're not, I wouldn't say they are known for being a pain, but when they go wrong, you know, because they put it in limp mode or they don't drive. But it wouldn't turn me off by an Aventador. We don't do, I do way more E-gears and F1 gear problems than I do Aventador problems. Uh, the other side of that is, if you start getting internal problems, the gearbox instantly goes into shutdown. So whereas if it's a manual and you're graunching into seconds, you can manage that problem, but on an E-gear or an F1 or an Artronic, they don't, they just go, no, no gears. So it's hard for me to say what a trend is when we only ever see problems. I don't see the hundred other owners with those cars that have never had an issue. So, but I think they're pretty good. Um, hi Ricky, I'm a big fan of your work. I have a question. Do your R8 V8 buyer's guide video, you mentioned to check the pull catches on a regular basis so you can open the front if the battery dies. Is it not possible to bump start the car, dumping the clutch while being pushed if the battery dies or would that damage your front diff? Right, so on the R8, have we got one in the working crop? Uh, uh, not a I tell one. you what, let's get the GT keys and yep. I'll show you where the pull is and then we can talk about GT. Let's, let's do, do it. I haven't got to take the mat down but I don't like folding mats because uh, they get damaged. Yep. If you pull this down on a Gen 1. Hang on, hang on, let me, uh... there we go. Yeah, can you see that orange cable? You just come in, yep. Should be sat there, if it's not, it's hidden up behind the sub. But if you pull that, you should do a front, front, front. Oh, piss off, Ross. <laughs> piss off, Ross. <laughs> They're just tight. There we go. There's a League of Gentlemen reference for you. That's where the front pull is. It is in the same place on a Gen 2. It's just neatly mounted rather than loose. And then you can lift the front. People white grease these. Don't use WD-40. WD-40 on the hinges, WD-40 on the latches. WD-40 on the security latch. Don't use white grease. White grease holds moisture in and it also then lets every single bit of dirt and crap stick to everything and they bind up solid. So just WD-40, that's all you need. Or we use Motul Easy Lube. I was waiting for that. <laughs> Sponsor friendly. Should we go back and redo that? Just use Motul <laughs> Easy Lube. Uh, if if the battery's dead and you want to bump start it, yes, you can. You can't do it on an Artronic, you can't do it on a DCT, so you can only do it in a manual. Uh, there's no reason why you can't. It's if it would go, is the honest answer. Because if your battery's dead flat, then there's not enough in there to run the, run the fuel pump, run the ECUs, turn the dash on, let the immobilizer off, so if you took it to the top of the hill and pushed it, dumped it in gear, I don't think the alternator would generate enough energy for enough time for the electronics to all come online, for it to register a road a vehicle, an engine speed at the crank sensor for it to let everything fire. So yes, you can bump start it. If a battery's dead flat, I don't think it would go. I think if you got in the car and went to start it and it was a manual and it went roll, roll, it wouldn't it's not fast enough to catch that would probably work but a dead flat battery i don't think it's going yeah i just don't think the alternator's got enough guts to bring everything up bring wake everything up to go so there we go that's what i think yeah so i think is that covered all of the questions I for today i think so i think so that's the good ones there yeah it's all right no yeah uh running through a gt what a gt's got over um the same age v10 ceramic brakes with anodized calipers, so only GT's got anodized calipers, uh, ceramic brakes, front canards in carbon. Lovely. If it's a spider, it was specced, it wasn't all of them. If it's a spider, carbon trims over the roof, do you remember? Yep. Um, whereas normally they'd be, so these ones, these be carbon on GT if specced. If not, they'd be silver. 
then you've got everything's matte carbon on GT so matte carbon blades matte carbon fixed wing that was the first R8 to have a fixed wing yeah no gen 1 has a fixed wing apart from a GT and then you go to um, a gen 2 and then the pluses have gone you would get door seals mats buckets if specced different color seat belts uh, Alcantara knee brace matte carbon everywhere so anything is matte carbon they only came in artronic they didn't come in a manual we have converted some to a manual they all came with the gear knob number so this is number 17 of 333 cars worldwide spiders 333 coupes and there was 33 of each brought into uk i've exported two so there's less now uh carbon you could have carbon dash surround binnacle carbon j surround carbon windscreen lower windscreen trim alcantara headlining with stitching you could also spec half roll cage which is in the gt that we've done the supercharged one uh race pack which had battery cut off uh and uh race modes light in here i don't know any cars in the uk that took that officially then you had uh this is carbon rear panel perspex rear lid yeah so that's like nearly 20 grand that you can't get them anymore 20 grand yeah and then this piece as well mate that's five grand just that rear trim wow rear bumper is different it was the first one to have circle tips they're not the same as a plus they're in a different place different rear lights so it sort of pisses me off now when everyone goes oh yeah yeah the new gen 2 gt it's not it's a it's a gen 2 with a body kit on it i'll build you one it's a yep. gen 2 with a body kit and not much else whereas that is a different car different chassis if we go in now and look at part numbers for chassis different part number for the frame if you want to but you can both go and buy a frame that's a 424 and everything else a 420 so a lot of people don't really appreciate perhaps how, how special, they, special are. they are yeah yeah that's why i say it's the best star rate ever made everyone goes on about lmx lmx was a run out that was a parts bin special they literally just took a gen to a gen one plus and just smashed laser lights on it a few other little bits and pieces it's not it's not rare it's not something i'd go out of my way to buy uh the only reason a gen one plus manual is rare is because nobody specced it they were all dcts so only nine cars in the uk got specced as a manual and there's seven left and we look after the seven we have at some point looked after the seven they've changed hands but they're rare because no one ordered it not because they were a limited number car yeah that's it go and have a look now see if you can fight yeah 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 they're better spec than spiders normally spiders normally people didn't take the seats there's one for sale at the minute it's got it's got muggles there's one for sale at the minute a spider it's got muggle seats in there what's the point like don't you want the, the yeah, whole shebang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah 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 so i love those i'd love those i'd have one every day of the week and that was david's old car so i knew the guy who owned that before he's owned that a really long time so Pete's just, that's probably one of the best in the country. Really, I love it. I think it's, and in black as well, it looks mega. Should we drop the video in of it arriving? Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, yeah, Pete's lad done a little video. So we'll drop that in yeah. now, because he watches. This is my dad's Audi R8 GT and we dropped it off at RE Performance to get some work done on it. So, 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 so. <laughs> get it out of my system but all good i think we're done we're all caught we're up done. tea time let's do it smash buttons say something nice we well, don't say nothing at all <laughs> make some questions yeah 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 kate's busy with a comment so keep it up kate <laughs> she comments director now yes yeah so no she's i think someone asked as well she's uh it's mine and her it's equal 50 50. I wound her up the first day. I went to, um, so we are, the, the business has two shares. She has one share, I have the other share. Yeah. <clears throat> Both directors. Um, but she is the financial secretary to HMRC. So she goes to jail, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the day we sorted out the, because we're limited, the day we sorted that out, I come home and I wound her up. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, we, because we'd gone in saying it was, it was never going to be anything any different. We don't have separate bank accounts, none of that. Everything goes, and um, I come home and said, oh, 
I said, accountant said I should do this, so I've, I've done it. She goes, what do you mean? I said, instead of having two shares, I said, I've done 100 shares. And I said, so you've got 49 and I've got 51 because I, I can't let anyone have majority control. You should have seen her face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Excellent. Yeah. Right. Let's... Uh, it's tea time, innit? Let's get a deal. I know. And it's freezing. I know. Watch League of Gentlemen. Oh, you're my wife now.